Well, I'm, I'm happy to report that we have a roving mic for questions and answers. So hopefully that'll make things less cumbersome uh, this time around. Um, before we begin, I just want to say explicitly um, how grateful I am for uh, the Institute for International Comparative and Area Studies who have helped organize this conference, gave us the first grant to support this conference, and they're doing a wonderful job administering it. So thanks to Gershon Shafir, director of ICAS. And, and my thanks to Jackie Tam, who's out in the hallway taking care of business, as she does so well. Don't cross her. Um, you don't want to cross her. All right. So this session um, will engage Amartya Sen's comparative view of justice more uh, concretely uh, in contrast to what he characterized as the transcendental approach of John Rawls, which we heard about in the last session. And the emphasis here uh, will be a bit more practical. Um, on what exactly Professor Sen means by, an, by a comparative approach to justice, um, on its relation with what we might think of as local knowledge, and its virtues, or perhaps superior virtues, in building bridges across diverse contexts through what Sen calls global public reasoning which incidentally involves an engagement with Adam Smith's moral psychology, which gets, gets me kind of excited and provoked. Um, I suspect Sam's comments will move in that direction. So um, you know, it's virtues on building bridges across diverse contexts, and second, in ameliorating concrete injustices on the ground. So our panelists are Janice Jenkins, um, professor of anthropology at UC San Diego and adjunct professor of psychiatry at the UCSD Medical School. Chandran Kukathis, uh, chair in political theory in the Department of Government at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Anthony Lyon, assistant director of the Ravel Humanities Program here at UCSD. And a bit of shameless self-promotion here. Anthony is a recently minted UCSD PhD. And, yeah. and, and just defended an excellent dissertation uh, in which he developed a new theory of relational representation suited to non-governmental actors in global politics. We're all very proud of Anthony and excited that he's here. Uh, on this panel. Nothing like a little pressure, right? <laughs> All right. All right. And Anche Wiener, a professor of political science and executive director of the Center for Globalization and Governance at the Universität Hamburg. And discussions, uh, discussants are Samuel Fleischacker, professor of philosophy at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and my colleague Tracy Strong, distinguished professor of political science here at UC San Diego. Now, Sen tells us that transcendental institutionalism is a mode of thinking about justice that finds its historical bearings in an Enlightenment tradition that involves uh, thinkers such as Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Rousseau, Kant, and much later Dworkin, Gautier, Nozick, Beitz, Poga. And Sen characterizes that tradition as follows. It's a quote from the book. It has two distinct features. First, it concentrates its attention on what it defines as perfect justice rather than on relative comparisons of justice and injustice. The inquiry is aimed at identifying the nature of the just rather than finding some criteria for an alternative being less just than another. Second, in searching for perf perfection, transcendental institutionalism concerns, co excuse me, concentrates primarily on getting the institutions right and is not directly focused on the actual societies that would ultimately emerge. Sen then describes an alternative Enlightenment tradition that embraces what he calls a comparative approach to social justice that is focused not on articulating abstract ideals, but on 
comparing less than ideal concrete social realizations. And it's a group that includes Adam Smith, Condorcet, Bentham, Wollstonecraft, John Stuart Mill, and later Kenneth Arrow. Now, one question, of course, is the, the, the intellectual history of this distinction and the way Sen has peopled these categories. And we can talk about this. Daryl Mollendorf's Rousseau got us started. Um, but on this panel, uh, particularly, I asked participants to focus primarily on Sen's idea of a comparative approach, leaving the history pretty much aside. After all, I'm not really sure it matters too much uh, uh, what someone earlier said about something um, from the perspective of, of ameliorating concrete injustices if you know, the distinction itself is not a compelling and useful one. And there are two ways I suggested that we might cut in. First, what does Sen's comparative approach, uh, to what extent does Sen's comparative approach take local knowledge seriously or more seriously than the transcendental approach? On the one hand, Sen's model has us looking at the ground at particular concrete cases and assessing how things are working out um, with more informational richness than a transcendental approach gives us. Um, the way things go on with actual human flourishing. But on the other hand, Sen is highly critical of relying too heavily in our assessments on what he calls self-reporting. People tend to become inured to their deprivations. They find coping mechanisms and strategies, um, often as a consequence of the deprivation itself. Uh, they have little capacity to aspire beyond what they know. Isolation makes local knowledge a precarious and unreliable source of information about the well-being of people on the ground. So where does Sen stand on the role of local knowledge in pressing forward in questions on global justice? Second, to what extent is the comparative approach more effective than the transcendental one in ameliorating urgent injustices and deprivations on the ground? On Sen's reading, the fatal flaw of the transcendental model, particularly in theories of global justice today, is that the theory refuses to settle with anything less than what he calls a complete ordering for distributional judgments, and thus misses opportunities for remediating real deprivations, injustices, unfreedoms, humiliations, as they go on here and now. Thomas Poga is often Sen's main target, though Bites and Barry get their licks too. There's a, there's a sense of urgency in Sen's theory, which I really appreciate. His eyes are on the ground. He writes, the demands of justice have to give priority to the removal of manifest injustices rather than concentrating on the long distance search for a perfectly just world of unbeatable magnificence. He continues, and I read this because it captures his voice so beautifully. He gets really worked up by utopian thinking about something as earthy and urgent as human deprivation. He writes, I would like to wish good luck to the builders of a transcendentally just set of institutions for the whole world. But for those who are ready to concentrate on reducing manifest injustices that so severely plague the world, the relevance of a merely partial ranking for a theory of justice can actually be quite momentous. So you can see how central social choice theory is for Sen um, here, because it enables comparative rankings without expecting completely ordered transcendental consensus. Social choice admits partial resolutions and limited agreements, acknowledging that unanimity on perfect justice is unlikely, but that action is absolutely urgently necessary. <coughs> Sen welcomes open public discussion, comparisons, disagreements, welcomes subjecting it all to open public scrutiny, and, and insists that reasoned arguments can and will emerge on how to manifest uh, to reduce manifest injustice in the world despite our divergent views on ideal regimes and principles. Disagreements, and this is very important, will not and need not be overcome. There will be holdouts, 
um, but Sun insists that this is not a cause for retreating to our corners and concluding that you are right in yours and I am right in mine. Okay, so let's uh, proceed as the schedule has it. So we'll begin with, with Jen Jenkins. Okay. Well, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers, Fauna uh, and Jerry, for an extraordinary job on what so far to me seems like quite a smash um, in terms of the conference and a wonderful way to inaugurate the new uh, Center for Global Justice here at UCSD. So this is so much work and uh, takes no small amount of both uh, moral and political courage. So I thank Ewan for this opportunity to uh, bring Professor Sen to us and to engage his ideas. Uh, two weeks ago, at 8.45 p.m., an urgent tweet made the rounds via a Facebook account entitled, Japan Never Gives Up. The message read, my two-year-old son put on his shoes and just ran outside saying, I'm going to arrest the earthquake. I was encouraged by the power and sense of justice housed in his small body. This response in the aftermath of the earthquake and tsunami that has devastated Japan illustrates not only a sense of urgency of hope, but also a palpable response to the pain and confusion that has colored the collective and intimate well-being of Japanese citizens. This provides a poignant illustration of Professor Sen's insistence that, quote, if the demands of justice have to give priority to the removal of manifest injustice, rather than concentrating on the long distance search for the perfectly just society, then the prevention and alleviation of disability cannot but be fairly central to the enterprise of advancing justice. For this session, my remarks are intended as an anthropological springboard for thinking about local knowledge and justice. I begin with some conceptual orienting coordinates for my observations. First is that more than any other discipline within social sciences and humanities, anthropology has been engaged in debates on what in human experience and organization is universal and what is specific to particular societies. Second, in anthropological thinking, such questions invariably entail comparison. While comparative method in anthropology has long been customary and explicit, contemporary anthropological approaches sometimes adopt an implicit tact toward comparison. Third, within anthropology today, the indivisibility of culture and knowledge is commonly accepted. Finally, the cultural and interpretive approach that my colleagues and I advance highlights an interlocking set of assumptions of the primacy of lived experience, the centrality of local moral worlds, and the reciprocal shaping of subjective experience and institutional forces of the nation state and forces of globalization. I turn now to engage some dimensions of Professor Sen's thought on well-being a topic close to my own interest in global health, prominently to include global mental health. Since, as recently declared in The Lancet, there is no health without mental health. Justice and injustice are not customarily conceived in relation to this overarching dimension of health and well-being when it comes to routine social practices and institutions within the life cycle. As Professor Sen noted in his address last evening, to address problems, we must first recognize them. Professor Sen asked us to think in terms of two sets of oppositions that together create four critical categories. The first is between well-being and agency, which we can gloss as modes of political subjectivity corresponding to the relationships between uh, relationships in ex existential terms between being and becoming. The second is that freedom and achievement or the circumstance in which one can act without undue constraint and the process by mastery of which one has the capacity of attaining goals. 
we can then understand well-being freedom as the freedom from suffering and agency freedom as freedom to act. Well-being achievement would be the domain of health promotion and illness prevention, while agency achievement would be the circumstances in which one is actively engaged in the realization of goals. In traversing <coughs> conceptual terrain frequented by medical anthropology, Professor Sen makes a critical observation about positional variations that form subjectivity in relation to the perception of morbidity in different regions in India. In Kerala, where healthcare is well developed and education levels are high and life expectancy relatively long, rates of self-perceived morbidity and relatively, are relatively considerably higher than in poor states like Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, where the conditions are reversed. This objective illusion of rates of illness, Sen argues, is an artifact of the greater attention focused on bodily or sensory experience. For Sen, both forms of perception are examples of an indigenous, emic, subjective, or what he calls an internal view. And there, quote, there is a conceptual contrast between the internal view of health based on a patient's own perception and external views based on observations and examinations by trained doctors and pathologists, unquote. It's important to point out that this association is in fact reversed among Euro-Americans with varying access to health care for whom self-appraisal of health status, subjective well-being, is significantly, and this significantly, I mean statistically significantly, associated predictive of morbidity and mortality. That is, if one perceives oneself to be in poor health, there is significantly greater likelihood of disease and mortality. Sun praises the anthropological analysis of the internal view that emphasized suffering as a central feature of illness by anthropologists such as Arthur Kleinman but also sees the anthropological perspective as thus limited to the sensory dimension of ill health. In fact, however, anthropology's strength comes in large part from its insistence on the analytic stance precisely at the intersection of the internal and the external. Medical anthropology examines the physician's mode of knowledge and discourse as equally a part of the cultural system as our patient perception and experience and goes on to articulate the relationship between them, often in terms of power, justice, and equality, as well as health policy. In doing so, it explicitly requires an understanding of the internal and external as ranging from the nuance of phenomenological indeterminacy to the vagaries of political economy in the domain of health and health care. One critical example of this insistence on bridging the internal and external approaches, which we can also identify as phenomenological and political levels of analysis, is the examination of instances of what I have called palpable insecurity. Let me begin by observing the curious lack of parallelism in bringing this concept into dialogue with the reasonable pragmatic justice of Professor Sen. That is, while security cannot be equated with justice, except in the logic of autocracy or authoritarianism. Insecurity can be equated with injustice insofar as men, as both, are insult to human dignity. The manner in which insecurity is palpable in the internal view is directly related to the manner in which insecurity is produced by injustice in the external view. I'll give an example of these considerations in relation to Professor Sen's categories of well-being, agency, freedom, and achievement. My example is that of depression, which according to current indices of disease burdens developed by the World Health Organization, the World Bank, and the Harvard School of Public Health, is hands down the most disabling of all diseases in low-income countries. Uh, Within wealthier, within wealthier countries, it's coronary heart disease followed by depression or disability. With that contemporary background, I turn now to a groundbreaking ethnography published in 1960 by anthropologist psychiatrist M.J. Field, Search for Security and Ethnopsychiatric Study of Rural Ghana. This ethnographic field study 
in a rural Akan area revealed depression to be common among both men and women. However, among women, depression was found to be quite frequent. When the study was published, the findings and detailed case studies con uh, generated considerable consternation since cherished ideologies of modernity, coloniality, and racism were called into question. Not only did simple, pre-modern people actually suffer from sophisticated elements such as depression, but a signature sign of depression, guilt, long thought to be reserved for Europeans as a necessary ingredient of moral development, was also observed as extremely common. The news was not taken well in clinical circles in London and indeed con constituted a major challenge to existing medical knowledge. The empirical challenge to the cultural knowledge of biomedicine went further, however, as often occurs once anthropological observers plumbed the depths of local knowledge. Among the Akan, the distress that Field identifies as depression was unsurprisingly not regarded as mental illness among the Akan. Okay. Um, the problem that Field identified as depression is well known primarily as a problem of witchcraft, for which, quote, nearly all such, such patients come to the shrines with spontaneous self-accusations of witchcraft, that is, of having caused harm without concrete act or conscious will. Now, I just say as an aside, uh, uh, very, um, so very, very simply, roughly put, in terms of comparing ethnopsychologies, this would be the lowest ab of self-esteem, what we might hear in somebody you know, say, saying that they feel very depressed, like, a worthless person, I've never done anything valuable in my life, but to show up at a shrine in Ghana with self-accusations of witchcraft is absolutely the worst, and that's what routinely happens. Happen in, in the, still happens in some places, but in this particular case that I'm telling you about. For middle-aged and elderly women in rural Ghana, Field finds depression with agitation to be one of the commonest and most clearly def defined of mental illnesses. The majority of these women are described as conscientious women of good personality who have worked hard and launched a fleet of well-brought-up children. Many of them have paid for their children's schooling with money earned by diligent trading, market gardening, or coca farming. They describe themselves as having difficulty doing any work or sitting still, adding, quote, soon, as soon as I f was, I knew that I was no good and that I had become a witch. I have done so much evil, I should be killed. That's what, a quote from one of Fields' um, cases. As common as these women's misery and self-accusations of witchcraft is, their experience of the unbearable strain of, quote, seeing, this is Field, seeing their husband take on an extra and younger wife so that he may continue to beget children. Flighty young girls in their teens are particularly attractive to men who are past their own prime, and the man frequently lavishes the young woman uh, money and luxuries which are among the fruits of the labor of his wife's years, older wife's years of labor. Whether described as depression or self-accusations of witchcraft, that the well-being of these women is severely compromised is without doubt. In case materials collected by Field, it's clear that these women are existentially shaken and confused, that their local cultural logic of reaping the benefits of hard work senior status, and high moral standing is faulty. They've done everything right. They've exerted their own agency skillfully and in ways that should have converted to happiness and contentment. Within this system of local cultural knowledge, there's little sympathy, little, very little sympathy for such women. Indeed, it is readily assented that they must be which is deserving of misery and should be socially shunned. For the typically non-literate individual, uh, living under such good conditions, how could they do anything other, anything to alter the structural violence of a situation that devalues women and their economic and psychological well-being? Such a right is vehemently denied by the gendered inequality of social privilege and opportunity. 
In Sen's terms, the social conditions for well-being as freedom from suffering and agency freedom to act on their own behalf are missing. In its place is an embodied palpable insecurity that women suffer as a collective consequ consequence when a notion of individual agency can be understood as either as thwarted or some kind of conceptually distant naivete. When what is culturally common sense, a cultural logic which reasons that when bad, misery making things happen, we need to look no further to, for the source of such misery than to the errant individual as obvious which in the Akan case are an individual lacking in industry or ingenuity in the case of an unemployed auto worker from Detroit. It seems apparent that to some significant degree their unwell being is their own making, their own inadequacy, their own failure to alter or adapt to their circumstances. What physician anthropologist and current U.S. De Deputy Envoy to Haiti, Paul Farmer, has described as pathologies of power are social and political determinants of well-being and agency worldwide. Such precarious circumstances shape life worlds, but not to similar disadvantage since there is an unequal ratio of depression worldwide whereby women are twice as likely to be afflicted. To a significant degree, these are differences to a significant degree, these differences are socially produced. In their classic uh, epidemiological work on the social origins of depression among working class women in southeast London, Brown and Harris were able to predict who would become depressed on the basis of concurrent factors. Poverty, unemployment, lack of social support, and the presence of three or more children. The Akan and the London women raised the question of whether well-being, as in the instance of depression, is better understood not as an individual condition, but rather an inevitable social condition that stems from the injustice of structural violence. When gendered and economic inequalities are construed as culturally commonsensical, the question arises as to how we can consider these as anything other than injustices insofar as violations of human dignities, as moral matters that define what really matters. As a matter of global justice, we would then seek what Professor Sen invoked last night, the art of the possible. What I could conceive as cultural imaginary that recognizes violations of human dignities through social abandonment or erasure as real social danger to the well-being of persons in real worlds, worlds that matters, as we seek to situate the very heart of the matter of justice, local and global. Thank you. Well, firstly, th thank you, Fana and uh, Jerry, for organizing such a, a wonderful occasion. And thank you to Professor Sen for providing, providing a reason for the occasion. Um, since in philosophy, criticism is the sincerest form of flattery, I'll try to be as critical as, as possible. Um, but uh, I, I fear that in the end, it will become apparent that I'm also a bit more on Sen's side than I, than I really want to be uh, as, a, as a critic. Um, and part of the reason for this is I also feel that, um, um, you know, we've organized this wonderful occasion uh, as a Sen Fest, but it's rapidly de degenerating into a Rawls Fest after that first session. So we, we need some, some sort of corrective, and um, a part of my mission here is to, is to provide this corrective. So you'll be surprised then to, to learn that um, my basic point in this uh, presentation is that Professor Sen doesn't have a theory of justice. Um, on the other hand, the, on the positive side, I think this is all to the good. So, you see, I'm, I'm being critical, but I'm, I'm also being nice. Um, so, um, I want to say really two things, why he has no theory and, and why it's, it's a good thing. But in order to do this, we're going to have to do a bit of rehearsing of, uh, of Sen's view. So we can start with the context very briefly, which is, I think, in a sense, an article by, by Tom Nagel um, on global justice, which suggests uh, that you can't have global justice without a global sovereign. And Sen's response is basically to say, well, yes, that's true with the current theories of justice, but we can do better, and, and I'm going to do better. And hence his critique of transcendental theories of, of justice, which he says um, are inadequate because, firstly, they're not uh, feasible for establishing conclusions about ideal social arrangements that um, you know, meet with demands for universal agreement among impartial, open-minded persons. And secondly, he says, we really don't need abstract ideal theories anyway. 
So what Sen proposes as an alternative is a theory of comparative justice. Okay? Uh, and, and why does he want this? Well, I think firstly he wants something that's going to be of practical use, which he thinks the transcendental theories uh, don't supply. Secondly, he wants to address issues of injustice, which again I think he feels that the, the transcendental theories neglect. Um, and he wants to offer us some sort of guidance. Um, so what we need, he, he says, is some sort of account of what is injustice, of what causes injustice, and of who's to be held responsible for the repair of this injustice. And we need some kind of account of the process uh, of dealing with injustice. And so for this, uh, Sen says, we need a number of things. Uh, firstly, we need a commitment to settling issues in a public forum. Uh, and we need to do this via democratic mechanisms. Uh, and we need to be searching for impartial judgment. Now, of crucial importance here for Sen is that it's not enough at this point to simply say, let's then turn to local tradition or prejudice. Okay? Um, it's not going to be enough just to say, well, you know, justice is what we do around here. That would be very practical, but, but wholly inadequate. But at the same time, he wants to say that it would be wrong to go for a kind of abstract universalism. That's what's wrong with the transcendental theories. They've you know, gone too far in the other direction. So how are we going to you know, find this via media between these two extremes of being confined by the local um, and being um, distracted by the, by the abstract in our pursuit of the universal. And his answer is that we look for a theory of comparative justice. So what does he have in mind when he talks about a theory of comparative justice? Well, I've, I've identified what I think are basically eight criteria that he, he mentions in his, in his work, the, the Idea of Justice. Firstly, uh, we need something that gives us uh, an agreement that's based on public reasonings or rankings of alternatives that can actually be realized. Okay. Uh, secondly, um, he thinks that a theory of justice has to have something to say about choices that are actually on offer, um, not just abstract um, ideal choices. Thirdly, a, th a theory has to have um, some kind of account or capacity to recognize that there is a plurality of reasons that we can think about or consider. People think about these things in many different ways. Fourthly, it has to allow for a conflict uh, of non-eliminable principles. There are sometimes going to be principles that we simply can't um, um, get rid of by um, arguing um, the matter of existence by finding superior alternatives. Fifthly, uh, the theory has to leave room for the possibility of reassessment. Um, nothing is forever. Uh, sixthly, the theory has to allow for a, an incomplete ranking of alternatives, um, partly because there are limitations of human knowledge, and sometimes simply because um, some alternatives can't be ranked. And this is one of the conclusions of social choice theory that he's done so much to show us uh, over the years. Seventhly, a theory has to allow for the diversity of interpretations um, when decisions have to be taken. Okay, we have got to recognize again uh, the plurality of uh, um, values and ideas in the world. And eighthly, he thinks that public reasoning should not be confined within a single state or region or community. In other words, this is what he means when he says we should search for um, open impartiality. Okay? So these are the considerations of the desiderata uh, Sen identifies when looking to come up with a theory of comparative justice. Uh, so, the question is, does Sen have a theory that conforms to these desiderata? And in my assessment, no, he doesn't, okay? because he doesn't have a theory of justice. Now, to make this claim, or to make good on this claim, I have to say something then about what I understand by a theory of justice. And this may, in, in the end, may be you know, where Sen and I disagree or, uh, or depart company um, on the question of what exactly is a theory of justice. But, you know, for the time being, let me suggest what a theory of justice is. Now, I have in mind here um, that justice is a word that's used in all kinds of ways. I mean, we use this word repeatedly, um, you know, whether we're in private conversation or we're assessing distributive claims or we're talking about the criminal law or even we're just talking about an Academy Awards ceremony where injustices are committed every year. Um, so, you know, we're not trying to find a theory of justice that encompasses all of these 
different meanings. But nonetheless, uh, political theorists have given a lot of time um, and reflection um, to this question of what is justice. Um, what does a theory of justice generally try to do? Um, well, what we have in mind here, I think, in political theory at least, is generally normative theory. We're looking for theory that's going to be action guiding and which is going to supply principles by which we can judge actions, by which we can judge outcomes, and by which we can judge institutions. And the world of political theory is replete with theories of justice. There are more theories of justice than you could poke a stick at. Um, there are egalitarian theories, there are libertarian theories, sufficientarian theories, prioritarian theories, and every one of these has an infinite number of, uh, of varieties. They're all normative theories which um, suggest how things ought to be distributed in, in the world. Um, and um, yeah, an egalitarian, for example, will have a theory explaining why it is that outcomes would be just if they're more equal in some way. A libertarian might have a theory explaining why an action is just if it's not rights violating, or an outcome is just if it's the result of a series of actions which are not themselves uh, rights violating. Um, all of these normative theories end up advancing principles of distribution in some way or another. Now, what strikes me about Sen's view is that he actually doesn't end up giving us a set of principles um, for distribution. Now, this is not because he's not interested in this question. Obviously, anyone who's read his work on capabilities, for one thing, will know that he's been uh, intensely interested in questions of distribution. But it seems to me that he's also interested in lots of other questions. When you look at the examples he gives of injustices that need to be addressed, some of these are injustices of distribution, others of them are injustices that are not distributive at all. They're concerned with things like, for example, the incidence of torture or the um, subjugation of women or racial discrimination. Um, they're all also forms of injustice that he thinks ought to be uh, should be addressed. What he hasn't given us is a kind of set of principles by which we could judge whether outcomes are just or whether actions are just or whether um, particular institutions are just. He hasn't given us um, a master principle. And I think this is actually all to the good because one of the insights I think of his work and that's made very explicit in his book is that if what we are interested in doing is um, addressing issues by engaging in a series of, you know, as he puts it, pairwise comparisons to make comparative judgments um, of uh, either um, outcomes or situations, what we'll end up doing is actually not coming up with a kind of generalization that has a great deal um, to recommend it. Okay. We're certainly not going to come up as a result of making these pairwise uh, comparisons with any kind of transcendental, transcendental theory. Now, if that's the case, um, one of the things I wonder then is that why think that we need to recognize out of all these pairwise comparisons that Sen wants to make that we need to have a general theory of justice? Why not just stop at that point and say, well, actually, what's wrong with all of these earlier um, efforts to come up with principles of justice? It's just a mistake. We should have been doing all along what Professor Sen has been suggesting, which is actually looking at issues of injustice addressing the institutional situations or asking questions about those outcomes and how they've come about, asking questions about how they might be addressed. We don't need to worry about thinking about transcendental theories, but why do we even need to think about comparative theories? Why do we need some kind of greater generalization? We can still address all the questions that he's concerned with without worrying about this. And in fact, there are some good reasons actually not to uh, try to come up with certain generalizations for the reasons that Sen himself has suggested. Recall that he emphasizes the importance of taking into account the plurality of reasons people invoke, the existence of conflicts of non eliminable principles, the importance of leaving room for the possibility of a reassessment of judgments and allowing for incomplete rankings of alternatives, and the possibility of diversity of interpretation or approach when decisions have to be taken. Now, if all of this is true, doesn't this actually supply a significant um, obstacle to our coming up with a kind of general theory? Um, and if it does, well, why should we be concerned 
because all of the important work that Sen is telling us to do, we can do without ever having a uh, need to appeal to a general principle or a general theory. We certainly don't need to go down, to the, down the transcendental route. I think he's made that very, very clear and very plain, and I think his arguments there are entirely convincing. But I think we can generate from his arguments against transcendentalism a conclusion that we actually don't even need to go so far as to look for a comparative theory of justice. So my conclusion in the end is that uh, Sen has not supplied us with a theory of comparative justice, and for this he's to be congratulated and encouraged. <laughs> So my remarks will focus on the difficulty of creating shared understandings of justice, and specifically, what type of relationship between actors, uh, individuals, or communities encourages the types of practices from which shared understandings of justice can emerge without the relationship itself becoming a source of injustice. My answer to this question is to think about these relationships as what I call relational representation. Uh, an intersubjective relationship that connects the insights of re the recognition literature uh, with a non-sovereign conception of representation. I'll first set out the relationship between Sen's comparison view of justice and the need for an intersubjective relationship. Second, I'll lay out the representative features of relational representation. And third, I'll illustrate this using the example of a non-governmental organization that um, I believe has successfully implemented a similar set of practices. Uh, that NGO, uh, familiar to quite a few in the audience, is uh, Partners in Health, an organization founded by Paul Farmer to provide what he calls a preferential health option for the poor, uh, which began in Haiti and has since expanded to several other countries. So first, uh, I read sends the idea of justice not so much as the articulation of a theory of justice, and in that sense I agree with Chandran, uh, but as an attempt to set out the considerations necessary to the moral psychology of a person who approaches justice from a comparison view. A comparison view requires one to see global justice as navigating between the particularity of locality and the apparent transcendence of universality. The challenge of this moral psychology is that such a person must approach injustice from an orientation of openness that can create relationships across diverse conceptions of justice without simply sur uh, surrendering one's own personal convictions about what justice is. For Sen, the comparison view of justice favors the adoption of a capabilities approach, which centers on the agency of the other as being what Paul Ricoeur calls capable persons, um, those who can intervene in the world to create change and meaning. And I think the relational representation describes this type of relationship and allows for the comparison view of justice to work. So there are two primary aspects of relational representation. Uh, first, it's an intersubjective relationship oriented by the process of acknowledgement, which provides the practical boundaries for the relationship. And second, relational representation is a form of representation that's non-sovereign. This signals a move away from concerns over authorization and toward the practices that work to represent the other responsively. In that sense, it's sort of very much in line with uh, Leyden's paper in the first panel. So first, acknowledgement. Uh, as developed in the work of Patch and Markell, and similarly by Honneth and Tully, uh, acknowledgement is an orienting stance toward others that emphasizes intersubjectivity by being attentive to developing the agency of the other, and not focusing on the complete recognition of their identity. Thus, for acknowledgement, recognition is an open and always incomplete process that allows the other to be a dynamic agent one who changes from the experience of being in that relationship. As such, acknowledgement sees agency developing through relationships that also always risk domination, and this consequently sets the practical boundaries of the relationship. That is, relationships um, grounded in acknowledgement must work to avoid domination and objectification. It's from this attentive and responsive orientation that the space opens in which it's possible to develop shared understandings of justice where they may not initially exist. Relational representation is also representative. And by that, I mean a relationship that seeks to develop a set of practices that can represent the other as, increase, as an increasingly capable person. And by represent, I mean to emphasize the idea that representation itself means to present again, 
Uh, and then so through these practices, you are constantly representing yourself and the other. Many non-governmental actors resist using the language of representation to describe their political activities that are outside the structures and institutions of government for two reasons. First, unlike governments, non-governmental actors lack a clear moment of authorization to legitimate their status as representatives. And without this authorization, they're stuck perpetually defending their status and the substance of their message gets lost. Second, there's an anxiety that claiming to speak for a community denies that community's capacity to speak for itself. I argue that neither of these difficulties are actually issues with representation. Rather, the apparent need for authorization and the anxiety over objectification are artifacts of sovereignty's demands for security and unity. Thus, representation need not reproduce these anxieties. If one drops the demand for an a priori authorization, legitimacy can evolve in the course of the relationship without concern over the specific moment in which it occurs. In place of authorization, it's necessary to build trust by demonstrating commitment. An example of committed practices is to work to actively diminish uh, the advantages that positional inequalities afford one agent in the relationship. This can be done through habits of listening, for example, um, particularly where one's advantages, either in expertise or resources, may give one's statements the weight of final decisions rather than being received as merely attempts to advance the discussion. So in viewing representation as a responsive relationship, the practice of speaking for another need not serve as a final pronouncement about the other. Rather, it's placed in this context of responses. Each utterance is a response, and it anticipates responses to it. In other words, a non-sovereign conception of representation transforms the traditional speaking for another into speaking along with another. So I'd like to conclude my remarks um, by trying to make relational representation more concrete by looking at the principles and practices of a particular NGO, Partners in Health, that has, over the last two decades, worked to cultivate this type of relationship with the communities in which they work. They've sought to enable the agency of persons suffering from the deprivations of inadequate health care, and in the process, they've made available a new shared understanding of what global justice in health can mean. Uh, in 1984, sort of brief history, um, with several others, Paul Farmer founded Partners in Health and set up a health clinic in rural Haiti aimed at providing a preferential health option for the impoverished communities. Now operating in several countries in addition to Haiti, the organization has grown and developed by responding to the medical and social needs articulated within the particular communities. Partners in Health developed a model of engagement borrowed from liberation theology to, uh, to observe, to judge, and to act. And these practices, done in that order, are key to the organization's early and continued success. The main practical insight from the organization's um, period of observation was that many health deprivations are linked to poverty itself and thus require more than just health care. They also require social programs and policy advocacy. And this is why SEN has been related uh, to partners in health uh, over the years. Uh, the two views are very much aligned. Uh, this observation changed the understandings of and approaches to healthcare provision for all involved, for partners in health, for the communities in Haiti, and for many others concerned with tackling similar injustices around the world. An example of this new understanding is the organization's strategy to fight multi-drug resistant tuberculosis not only by providing first-line medicine, but also through a program of local community health workers who follow up with the patient's drug regimens. Here it's evident that Partners in Health demonstrates both the acknowledging and representative aspects of relational representation. Their practices aim to enable the agency of the persons in these communities on two levels. First, the provision of health care is central to the capacity of persons to effectively use their agency. And second, Partners in Health consciously cultivates practices that avoid domination by establishing healthcare services and working to make their provision directed entirely locally. Further, the practices of Partners in Health capture the goal of representation, which is not simply to reflect who another is, but to aim to represent them as the capable persons that they can be.
as evident in the practices of partners in health, in being attentive to the agency um, of the other. It's possible to develop shared understandings that are distinct from any of the original understandings the participants had. For partners in health, their understanding of healthcare has changed from being a humanitarian service to being a matter of basic human rights. And similarly, through this relationship, many of the persons in these communities have come to share this understanding of healthcare as a basic human right and consequently reconceived their lives as deprivations and matters of injustice. So at the core of SENS, the idea of justice, rests the conviction that global justice is available to all. Perspectives of justice that prioritize the markers of identity over the agency of individuals present those external to the local knowledge and often those dissenting within that local knowledge from working against many manifest injustices. Indeed, the risk of domination and inequality is unavoidable in these relationships, but that risk should not close the possibility of ameliorating suffering. It calls for a measured approach that recognizes injustice is only overcome by enabling the agency of those who are suffering. Global justice is not the knowledge that one brings to another. It's the shared understandings of justice that emerge in the course of a reciprocal relationship that's constantly attentive and open to the agency of the other. Thank you. Thank you. Invitation, and also for, for the way you group the papers. I think I couldn't have followed a, a more fitting uh, final conclusion than, than Tony's conclusion about <laughs> shared understandings of justice. And I problematize um, this possibility a little bit in the paper. Um, Perhaps on, on the title of the conference, I wonder whether we are really talking about new frontiers of uh, global justice or whether we are not rather uh, looking at new ways of uh, looking at old frontiers uh, of global justice, which we might have overlooked. Uh, and um, to that, I could, my paper could also be titled Accounting for Diversity in the Search for Global Justice. And I should probably say that, that I'm coming at this as an international relations theory uh, uh, scholar. Uh, I'm not a political philosopher or political theorist. I, I did read Rawls 20 years back here with Sue Muller Oaken. Uh, that was a long time back and uh, then went into international relations theory. What I really congratulate uh, Amartya Sen for is kicking off this debate, Sen Rawls. And, and I think that is something that in international relations theorists, theories we can really use as a frame to place what we're doing in international relations. Now, uh, and this is a way that I should say when, when international relations theorists do theory, we usually we take kind of a, a magpie approach we pick what's shiny and a, and a nice concept from another discipline and import it, and then don't really care much about the debate, uh, such as the global justice debate that's now carried out. So I thank you for providing the space uh, for me to think about this. Now, uh, the, my argument is that uh, individual interpretations of justice have changed uh, in a shift from a merely globalized towards constitutionalized international relations. So that's kind of my, my twist on, on your finding. And so to that end, um, I take a comparative microperspectival study of international individual interaction. And the paper uh, elaborates on this argument to demonstrate how such an approach might work with a view to replacing the concept of international justice as interstate justice. And I do think there is an issue with states. Uh, and that hasn't been fi kind of finally discussed in the first panel, because if we think, we, if we take the transcendental route, we, we do work with an assumption of states in the background. And so we need to think about a way of replacing the concept of international justice with global justice. Now, to that end, I, the paper proceeds in three steps. Uh, one, I address the community problem in IR theory. Uh, uh, two highlights the normative structure of meaning in use as an empirical access point uh, to
to identify the contextual roots of justice. And then three, uh, I discuss the impact of local knowledge uh, for an alternative view on, on justice. Now, in the first step, and I just speak to the paper, I summarize quickly, as I notice that I'm standing between Amartya's comments uh, and, uh, and lunch, actually. <laughs> uh, with my paper here. So I agree with Stan in, 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 in his critique uh, of the Rawlsian original position and, and its application to international relations as merely leading to a situation of international justice, which remains to be differentiated from global justice. This position, I argue, is highly compatible with the assumption that the liberal community lies at the core of a global map which is widely held by liberal international relations theorists. And that's, uh, I can safely say, the majority of uh, the international relations uh, discipline. Now, the issue I take with the liberal international relations theory literature is the relative absence of problematizing the impact and hence overlooking the oft unintended consequences of inherent liberal community assumptions in global politics. Now, in my view, Zen pins the problem down very nicely when noting, and I quote, even in the politically divisive world in which we live, we have to give fuller recognition to the fact that different persons across borders need to operate only through international or interpeople relations. The world is certainly divisive, but it is diversely divisive. And the partitioning of the global um, population into distinct nations or peoples is not the only line of division. And I suggest to comprehend the impact and potential of this diversity for global justice, we need to take a micro-perspectival approach, which is comparative and studies individual interaction. Now, in the following section, the paper zooms in onto uh, this diversity uh, and uh, it compares different social groups in Europe and it confirms the impact of experience on the way individuals interpret fundamental norms in global politics. And there are then indeed genuinely plural, I quote, sometimes conflicting general concerns that bear on our understanding of justice. So we cannot assume once we sign a treaty about fundamental norms of human rights, democracy and so on, that everybody actually goes home and does the same thing with it. Now, in my second step, I look at what's the normative meaning that's actually in use when, when we go home after signing such a treaty. And in my own research, I sought to address this community problem in a fashion that I think is quite similar to Zen's critical take on Rawls' institutional focus. And it also stresses the uh, contextual awareness assessed by problem-focused empirical studies, rather than seeking to optimize institutional design based on, and excuse my my slight criticism or my distance from, from, from the discipline of the majority here based on philosophical considerations. So to that, I, I, I draw a lot on, on a philosoph philosopher who has, has brought philosophy uh, uh, closer to me uh, than anybody else, and that's Jim Tully here, who suggested uh, to take a bifocal approach, which allows me to work with my empirical policy studies, but at the same time take a normative stance, which I find very important. And that work uh, generally two results, and I really do a, a very rough summary here. First, I found um, that different from Karl Deutsch's uh, and many other European integration scholars' predictions, uh, enhanced interaction in the process of regional integration in, in Europe did not lead to harmonization or, in fact, Europeanization. We can therefore not assume that fundamental norms are met with shared social recognition across the European Union. Instead, the degree of appropriateness associated with norms varies according to individual interaction in a specific context. Now, very briefly on the case, when prompted in systematically conducted uh, semi-structured interviews that triggered expressive utterances, not rational explanations, gut reactions, four groups in Europe um, or of two different na nationalities, British and Germans, uh, that were operating in three different locations in London, Berlin and Brussels, revealed 
three different normative structures bearing the distinct indexicality of associate connotations, associative connotations with leading fundamental norms of justice, such as democracy, the rule of law, citizenship, human and fundamental rights. Now, these sets of connotations make individual background experience accountable. And I drew on Garfinkel for that to demonstrate the accountability of what we actually think or, or what we spontaneously think but don't necessarily rationally explain. In that way, they shed light on hidden indexicality of the normative structures of meaning and use that are enacted through and constituted by individual uh, interaction. Notably, the originally distinct four social groups turned out to generate only three such normative structures. Now, the second finding is normative. I noted that following, or is of normative implications, I should say, I noted that following iterated international interaction, the contours of a space emerged, which I define as a transnational arena. In this arena, the interviewed individuals demonstrated associated connotations with fundamental norms that were common among a mixed nationality group and distinct from two groups of common nationality. That's the Brusselites. In Brussels, you would have Germans and, and, and British taking on similar interpretations, whereas in London and Berlin, they couldn't be more different, sometimes 180 mm -hmm. degrees, where the Germans would associate security with citizenship and the British civil rights. And I carried out this empirical exercise nine times, and it's called binary opposition deriving. And you can nicely establish that people couldn't be more different, even though they're supposed to be the same kind of small European group that is the core of the liberal community uh, of these, uh, including uh, other northern states. But from which the core of these liberal assumptions stem from. So the big question is there, and I think it falls squarely into, into Zen's uh, argument that we need to come up from, from the bottom. So uh, what I found then that uh, the comparative route towards justice uh, suggests that uh, traditional indicators of shared interpretations of norms are not reliable when tested empirically. Neither the philosophical assumptions about either the original position or the liberal community, nor social science indicators such as harmonization or national identity would have predicted uh, these findings. Now, I'm waiting for your card, for the five minutes card, but anyways. Oh, I'm getting a two minutes card? Okay. <laughs> See, that's how, 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 how norms work. I already adopted the norm that I get a five minutes card, now I'm getting a two minutes card. Well, um, so from, from this finding of different, I'm fine, I'm, I'm good. From this finding of, of, of difference uh, with regard to um, the normative structure of meaning in use, I argue it is possible to conclude that the more individual interaction takes place within a stable social context, over a given period of time, sociologists have a better, uh, better take on this, but I, I would say about five years' time, the smaller differences with regard to the interpretation of fundamental norms, values, and principles become, and the higher the degree of social recognition. Crucially, this finding suggests that in the absence of a community with fixed membership, and I've heard a lot of people talking about their fellow citizens, and that's another assumption. We don't all have fellow citizens. There's a lot of people who, are, who don't have citizenship or have a contested citizenship status. So a community with fixed membership where the social structures and political institutions overlap within a single constitutionally qualified territory, one of Rawls's conditions, social recognition must be measured from the bottom up, i.e. following individual interaction. It cannot be taken as given, as the liberal community assumption would suggest. Now, for analytical reasons of distinctions, I have termed this bottom-up procedure cultural validation. It's not necessarily about culture at large, uh, but it's, uh, it, it um, defines the individual interaction uh, that is specific in this process, in distinction from social recognition, which is a group process. In the absence 
of iterated individual interaction in a stable context, the interpretation of norms and values and principles must therefore be taken as individually distinct and therefore potentially conflictive. Now this is really where, where philosophy comes in and where it gets interesting because we need conflict, we need contestation in order to, to fight out uh, the normative background. But if you think international relations and in a moment of crisis and if the, the leading norms which will tell me whether I, I opt in favor or against military interaction are not shared with the guy on the other side of the table, then conflict is not such a good thing. Um, so to capture this distinct perspective on fundamental norms, I suggested to break normative meanings down into three activity-based dimensions of norms which can be studied separately and that's formal validation, that was is written down, social recognition, that was is shared by a social group and cultural validation that what is experienced individually. And if I may just with, uh, close with uh, two questions, um, which would be, um, and I suggest the answers to them. One is how is community possible? And two, that's the question I see for this project, how is legitimate governance possible globally? Now the answer to the first question would go, through iterated individual interaction within a stable context. And of course that stable context isn't there, so that's our problem to think about. And the second one is uh, the answer to the legitimate governance question would be uh, through negotiated normativity. And there my, my major suggestion is to step down from fundamental norms or meta norms of human rights, democracy and so forth because they are not worth the paper they are written on in an international treaty when you go and then um, implement them in a, a context at home. But we need to think about organizing principles that emerge from these contexts such as through the climate negotiations in Copenhagen, which I saw as more successful than others with my approach, because we came up with a, um, a, an organizing principle, which I think is sort of a starter, and that's a common uh, but differentiated responsibility for climate change. Thank you. I also want to thank uh, Jerry and Fauna for organizing a wonderfully interdisciplinary conference. It's always a pleasure to go to things like that, and they happen too rarely. Um, of course, that means that we talk past each other to some extent, but uh, it's a price that's sometimes worth paying. Um, Chandran Kukata says that Sen's focus on comparative justice makes it impossible for him to have a theory of justice. I'm not sure that's true, but what I'm about to say will probably encourage such doubts. The other contributors to this panel focus in a variety of very interesting ways on the relationship between local knowledge and the moral universals that we want at times to apply across these local contexts. The empirical work described by Jenkins and Wiener provide nice support, I think, for Sen's stress on the importance of cultural detail when seeking to implement our ideals. Lyon brings out, more generally, the way Sen tries to walk between the local and the universal throughout the idea of justice. This is indeed a central theme of the book, one of its most wonderful and refreshing features, I think. Lyon's approach to that relationship differs from Sen's, however. He proposes that we engage in what he calls acknowledgement, an attempt to reach shared understandings of justice, his phrase, with others that begins from the understanding that, quote, the recognition of the other is a continual process that will always be incomplete. I think the process Lyon describes is very rich and intriguing and that it closely resembles what Adam Smith called sympathy, to achieve which we must bring home to ourselves, Smith's phrase, every detail of the circumstances of others and even then can only approximate their sentiments. In any case, Smith is the figure with whom Sen tries most to find his way between the skiller of localism and the charybdis of universalism. And when Fona invited me here, she asked me to comment on Sen's use of Smith. So I'd like to consider briefly the degree to which Smith can help us think through the relationship between the local and the universal. Sen is too hasty, I believe, to attribute to Smith the view that moral judgments should be informed by the views of people far outside one's cultural community. 
The need to invoke how things would look to any other fair and impartial spectator, says Sen, is a requirement that can bring in judgments that would be made by disinterested people from other societies as well, unquote. And again, impartial views may come from far or from within a community or a nation or a culture, and Smith argued that there is room for and need for both, all from Sen. Sen holds up Smith's device of the impartial spectator as a model of what he calls open impartiality, contrasting it with John Rawls's device of the or original position, which he sees as limited to the members of a particular society, and thus a model of closed impartiality. Much as I like any praise of Adam Smith and share Sen's culturally pluralist instincts, I want to raise some doubts about these claims. I've argued elsewhere that Smith's impartial spectator is not all that open, is indeed limited precisely by the moral conceptions entrenched in particular societies, and Fona has elaborated and deepened this point in her terrific book, Adam Smith and the Circles of Sympathy. I'd like to sketch here my reservations about Sen's use of Smith in this regard. It's not easy to say exactly where Smith stands on matters of cultural pluralism. Generally, Smith describes his impartial spectator device as helping us understand what it is, quote, to view ourselves with the eyes of other people, unquote, leaving open whether this means any, much less all other people, or just some other people, such as the people in our own particular society. Sen favors two passages in Smith's text that appear to say something stronger. In the first, which comes from the theory of moral sentiments, Smith says that we, quote, endeavor to imagine our own conduct as we imagine any other fair and impartial spectator would imagine it. This is the passage quoted in the uh, section from Sen I first mentioned. In the second, from Smith's lectures on jurisprudence, Smith says that we ought to inflict only those punishments on offenders that, quote, appear equitable in the eyes of the rest of mankind, unquote. Both of these passages seem to call for the sentiments of all humanity, not of a particular society, to serve as our criterion for moral judgment. On a closer look, however, I don't think this is so clear in the second passage. Smith is there contrasting what appears equitable to the injured party, who is angry about his or her injury and therefore may not see the situation fairly, with what appears equitable to other people. By the rest of mankind, then, he just means anyone but the person who wants revenge for the injury done to him. The focus, here as elsewhere in Smith, is on the great difference between how we see ourselves and how others see us, not on exactly who those others may be. But I do think the passage from the theory of moral sentiment favors Sen's view. Indeed, there the phrase, any other impartial spectator, was substituted in the final edition of the book for an impartial spectator, as if to stress precisely the point that the impartial spectator should represent a perspective shared by all human beings, any or all. In her book, Fona shows in nice detail how Smith reaches for a more cosmopolitan point of view in the last edition of The Theory of Moral Sentiments, and this passage fits that reading very well. So there's no question, I think, that Smith aspired to provide a standard of moral judgment that would reach out across national and cultural borders, enabling us to hear voices from far and near when we make our decisions. The question is whether the device Smith came up with, as he characterized it, is really capable of doing that. And about that, I'm skeptical. Why? Well, consider what Smith tells us about the impartial spectator in general. In the first place, it uses sentiments rather than reason as the basis of its judgments. Smith's impartial spectator is not like Roderick First's ideal observer, dispassionately watching people from above the emotional fray. Rather, Smith follows his teacher Francis Hutcheson and friend David Hume in tracing all moral judgment, ultimately, to some one or more of our feelings. The impartial spectator is supposed to be free of partial feelings, feelings that depend on a stake it might have in a dispute or on a blind favoritism or dislike for one party or the other, but it is not supposed to be free of feelings altogether, nor is it supposed to reach for a principle it might derive from reason alone independent of all feelings. But feelings are notoriously shaped by social circumstances, and it is not clear how a device that depends on feelings could correct 
for systematic biases in our society's modes of feeling. In the second place, the impartial spectator develops within us, Smith says, as part of our efforts to align our feelings with those of the people immediately around us. The chief part of human happiness, Smith tells us, comes from the consciousness that other people like and admire us. But that's not possible unless our feelings and the actions we carry out on the basis of those feelings meet with other people's approval. The search for feelings we can all share for mutual sympathy is therefore one of the most basic human drives for Smith and it leads among other things to the rise of morality. Initially this means that we seek the actual approval of the actual people we encounter. But we soon learn that many of our neighbors judge us without knowing our circumstances or out of a blind bias or personal stake they have in what we're doing. In order to defend ourselves from such partial judgments, says Smith, we learn to set up in our own minds a judge between ourselves and those we live with. We conceive ourselves as acting in the presence of a person quite candid and equitable who has no particular relation either to ourselves or to those whose interests are affected by our conduct." End quote from Smith. This is the impartial spectator. But there's no suggestion that this impartial spectator uses different methods of judging, appeals to different sorts of norms than our neighbors do. The imagined spectator within us arises out of the actual process of moral judgment around us, and we heed it as part of our drive to find a, a harmony of feelings with our actual neighbors. It seems very unlikely, then, that it would use a method of judging radically unlike those of our actual neighbors, or perceive, let alone correct for, a systematic bias in the sentiments of our actual society. If sentiments of condescension or dislike toward poor people, or black people, or gay people pervade our society, then there's every reason to expect that the impartial spectator we build within us will share those biases rather than rising above them. These are the sorts of considerations that lead Smith to worry about the danger that established custom, as he calls it, can severely distort moral judgment, and that nature itself may lead people to admire the rich and despise the poor. It's a great worry of his throughout the theory of moral sentiments. Smith also worries that religious fanaticism can pervert our moral feelings and does not suggest that his moral theory provides a good way of correcting for that danger. So what, one might ask? Suppose one grants that Smith's own account is limited in these ways, that it gears us toward the established sentiments of our own society rather than opening us to the views and attitudes of human beings in distant cultures. Is it not perfectly reasonable for Sen, nevertheless, to use the implicit reach of Smith's moral theory as the basis for a new understanding of moral and political judgment, to attend to Smith's aspirations, as it were, as against the features of Smith's theory that get in the way of those aspirations? Fona says in a footnote to her book that Sen has told her that this is precisely what he's trying to do, that he is, quote, less concerned about being faithful to Smith's theory and more with what might be made of that theory for other purposes, unquote. The problem is that much that is attractive about Smith's theory is bound up with its limits. The relativistic tendencies in Smith are not a mere mistake, but a consequence of the structure of his theory. The absence of transcendental principles in Smith's theory in favor of judgments rooted in our everyday sentiments. The view of individuals as aiming in their moral judgments for a harmony with the people around them. The emphasis on judging each situation in its concrete detail, the psychological insight of his view of moral development, all these things go together with a picture on which we are deeply shaped by our local societies and the way we make moral judgments and can turn those judgments on our society's practices only with difficulty. I've argued that elsewhere that Smith thought better information about the lives of poor people could help well-off people judge the poor more favorably, and perhaps he thought that slavery and other injustices could likewise be overturned by better information, by information enabling people to project themselves into the lives of slaves especially, and thereby to sympathize with them. I also think Sen's work in this book and in much of his other writing has been directed at such a name, helping Westerners better understand the lives of people in developing countries, for instance. And I think he has had a considerable impact thereby on the overturning of biases and misimpressions. For this reason and for his work on famines and hunger, a particular focus of Smith, I regard Sen as the true heir to Smith in the modern day, in fact. 
But it's hard to imagine that better information alone will undermine all ideological, religious, and cultural biases. Entrenched as those biases often are in the very way we process information. For that reason, I am unconvinced that any version of Smith's moral theory can alone underwrite a truly open impartiality, worthy as that ideal may be, and much as Smith himself may have aspired to it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to associate myself with all of the expressions of gratitude to the organizers which have been made by the people before me. Uh, before starting on the gist of my remarks, one thing about the previous panel, uh, one should beware in the back of the room, Jack, that problem concerns half the human race and you're just working on it? <laughs> now that's the difference that's there. I take that said, the central achievements of Rawls to have shown, as far as I can tell, definitively, first, that no natural difference between us can constitute a reason for one of us having dominion over the other, and second, that the fact that one despises someone, say they partake of a culture whose practices you despise, the fact that one despises someone can never be a reason also for having dominion over that person. I think that Amartya Sen shares these understandings, and I think further, however, that his comparison view of justice implies that no single view of justice can claim preeminence. Think here of his touchstone example of the flute and the three children. Uh, the first makes the flute but doesn't know how to play it, the second is really good flute player, and the third doesn't have anything of her own. Who's flute? Uh, no single view of justice can, attain, can claim preeminence, but more importantly, that any such claim to preeminence must necessarily be wrong. It follows from this that Sen, like I believe Charles Taylor, who is not discussed by Sen and mentioned only in passing, thinks that uh, th that Charles Taylor thinks that we must be open-minded, that is, always leaving open the possibility of mutual learning from each other's moral universe. In practice, this means, quoting Taylor, we should agree on norms while disagreeing on what, the, on what are the right norms, and we should be content to live in this consensus undisturbed by differences of profound underlying belief. And we should here be wary of taking le our lessons, making our lessons too easy. It is worth noting that the demonstrators in Tiananmen Square made appeal to American-type rights, but they did so on a purely instrumental basis in order to build up Chinese national pride. Wu Kaishi called upon the spirit of the May 4th movement, for instance, and said, we have only one goal, the modernization of China. Uh, the point here is that it was only by foregoing ultimate justifications that one can build global human rights on and from traditional and different cultural resources. For instance, consider as an example the value of filial piety, and I steal this example from Daniel Bell. Uh, East Asian societies influenced by Confucianism strongly emphasize the idea that children have a duty to care for their elderly parents, a duty to be forsaken only in the most exceptional circumstances. In political practice, this means that parents have a right to be cared for by their children. This is not, you may have noticed, the case in this country. Uh, there are disputes about the best means of implementing this right. In Japan and Singapore, there are laws that make it mandatory to provide financial support for elderly parents, whereas Hong Kong uses more indirect methods such as tax breaks, housing benefits, and so forth. But the assumption is that there is a pressing need to secure this right, and, that's not, and that is not a matter of political controversy in East Asia. Now, during the course of a cross-cultural dialogue, it is not inconceivable that non-East Asian states might also come to regard the right to be cared for by adult children as a human right, but not on the basis of Confucianism. For example, Western participants may come to question the assumption that relatively fit elderly parents can be committed to nursing homes. More pragmatically, the promotion of, quote, filial piety could be seen as advantageous in an age when social security payments are no longer economically sustainable at the current level. If these arguments are sufficiently persuasive to non-Asian participants, perhaps all parties can agree that the right to be cared for by adult children should be included in an unforced consensus on rights. <laughs> 
Any universalist theory, however, of, but you notice it's not a universalist, doesn't rest on anything universal. Any universalist theory of rights exhibit what one might, might call a parochial universalism. I want to turn now briefly to the papers on this panel and do uh, very little justice to them. I want to reinforce Janice Jenkins' paper especially. She usefully binds sense four categories, well-being and agency, freedom and achievement, into I always love it when you get a matrix. It just makes my heart sing. Um, gives us four realms of human activity. To each of these, she brings a desire to bridge a view of, a, of that activity that is internal with a view that is external. That is to relate what one experiences to the condition that make that experience possible, phenomenology and politics, as she says. The central question becomes for her, what is one to do when an act that is right and excellent is experienced because of external circumstances as wrong? And though she does not immediately apply this to the overall question of justice and rights, it's not hard to see how to do so. And it's also not clear to me how social choice theory in the manner that Amartya Sen advances it uh, can respond easily to the problem that she raises. I may be wrong on that. Anche Wiener speaks of the importance of replacing the community of the Rawlsian original position with, I quote, access to a transnational arena. And underlying this is the very important question is what the effects are on developments in mobility, in communication, in technology, and so forth are for global justice. Uh, you know, are cell phones a good thing? Uh, the result, she draws on Tully's work, is what he calls globalize, glo globalization. The point, and she points to the EU as examples of these new arenas, giving a very interesting understanding of it. I think this is good and important. And I want to raise a question, however, which seems to me to go along with this, though it's not part of her paper. One of the effect of the transnationalization of relations, in the manner that she's talking about, is the concomitant appearance of actors who have no loyalties other than to themselves. The transnational, the national state did have some uses and we should not abandon it without thought. I wonder if she would share Nietzsche, since Sen started out by mentioning Nietzsche, I was stunned, um, only to reject him, but that's, but you know, we all make mistakes. Um, <laughs> I wonder if she would share Nietzsche's anxieties when he writes of I'm quoting Nietzsche, atrophies of the political sphere, he means the state here, that are equally dangerous for art and society. If there should exist men, still Nietzsche, who through birth find their place outside the national and state instincts and who consequently need only to value the state insofar as they find that it coincides with their own interest, then such men will necessarily imagine the ultimate aim of politics to be the most undisturbed coexistence of great political communities possible such that they might pursue their own purposes without restriction. And this is obviously uh, moves in the direction of, of non-national actors who nonetheless carry enormous amount of power. The per minute transfer of capital, I believe, is $2.2 billion every day. Chandra Kukathis sees Sen as trying to steer a course between abstract universalism and concrete localism in a, in a, to, in essence, enhance our perspective, that is, viewing as ourselves what others view. I note parenthetically that a not dissimilar enterprise is taken, though I think Chandra will not help agree with this, by Hannah Arendt, not a name that appears in Sen or in Rawls, but was mentioned, thank you, Farid, this morning. Kukathis goes on to say that while this may be desirable, it entails the fact that no theory of comparative justice is possible and that Sen does not and cannot have one. And he says this is all to the good. For justice is not, quote, the master idea that subsumes all else, quoting Chandran. I have some sympathies with this conclusion, although I believe that the ideas in Lyon's paper pointed another path. But I would ask a question here. If there is no theory of comparative justice possible, why or how is the recognition of injustice so easy? No one apparently seems to need a theory of injustice, and it's worth thinking about that. Now, turning to, uh, to Anthony Lyon, Foucault once remarked that we need, we need a theory of politics that does not invoke sovereignty. 
Uh, Lyon brings to bear a notion of what he calls rep relational representation. Central to this notion, this idea, is the notion of acknowledgement, which he takes from Patch and Markell, who in turn takes it actually from Stanley Cavell, another colleague of Amartya's. Acknowledgement seeks to rethink recognition of another as a manner of approaching the other without raising the question of his or her constituent identity. It focuses on what is done rather than on what one thinks one is. Consider, you are late. You know you are late. I know you are late. You know I know you are late. But knowledge is not enough. I have to do, you have to do something. You have to say, I am sorry. That it is the act which is centrally important. It's what people do that counts in this relationship, not what they know, and therefore not theory, by the way. Uh, if you want, and if you don't do that, there will be no world between us. In terms of global justice, this means that attention should be paid to what others do, not what they say they believe. Thirdly, and last, I should like to raise a question here which is, uh, has to accompany any discussion of global justice or justice per se. It is by and large missing in Rawls. I think that Sen gives us a possible opening to it in his discussion of public reason, but I don't think he does so explicitly. The matter is simply this. Suppose we have achieved a reasonably well-ordered society. We made improvements in justice, even of the minimalist kind that Rawls describes in political liberalism. It is clear, and Rawls even says so, and it's implicit in Sen that people will disagree about what precisely justice entails. One of the consequences, a desirable one, of the lack of final answers is that we have to have disagreement. Disagreement is a good thing. A central question, not asked by Rawls and only hinted at by Sen, is as to what kind of public discourse should cover disagreement. I do not think the solution to discursive democracy with its underlying emphasis and rationality, nor the communicative rationality of a Habermas are sufficient. To be blunt on this, what we need is an understanding of what constitutes good political rhetoric. And I mean good in relation to questions of justice. This necessarily means about good examples of, we would have to call them leaders, of people who are able to engage in good political rhetoric. I use rhetoric not derogatorily, but as a term of praise. What are good exemplars of public argument? A classic example would be the Lincoln-Douglas debates. We might think of Dr. King. More contemporary examples, and I would include uh, President Obama, seem distressingly thin. Who shows us, we have to think about, who are the examples of who, show, who show us how to disagree, how to contest, how to change our minds, how to argue, how to struggle? Thank you. Um, well, it was really a very exciting morning, like um, second session, like the first session. Um, just to make a few points quickly, um, I think the, the way we, we started off by far now referring to the local and um, global knowledge and perspectives was an important one. Um, I thought that actually the book was not motivated, of course, to bring in local knowledge, so happens that uh, my claim would be that you couldn't get there without the local knowledge. But that doesn't mean that global knowledge was being kicked at either. And there are all kinds of cases where local knowledge could be a big restriction relying on it. I, didn't, I don't really enter the debate in some ways, but the implications are uh, certainly there. And, and in many ways, the, uh, what um, Janis said and what Ante said um, brings out the, the, the force of that way of looking at it. So I was delighted. So it, it doesn't seem to be working. I, I can just about hear myself. But <laughs> yeah. Go. Is that any better? You don't need this here. Okay. This here. Just here. You've got it. Right. Have I got it? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. You will tell me if, I <laughs> if I'm not. Um, I'll come to the question of the. Um, uh, well, I may come back to that uh, again if I get a chance towards the end. But let me say that, I, again, with uh, Giannis's uh, comment and, uh, and, uh, and Ante's, I, I really don't have very much to add. I learned a great deal from them, and I think um, uh, the 
palatable insecurity is, is a very important notion. And, uh, and uh, on tier two, and I particularly like the fact that it, the global justice being distinguished from international justice does allow the individual, and that does not undermine the cultural differences. And she pointed out even a great example between Germany and, and Britain, which is in many ways thought to be the same culture, certainly. In, Sam Huntington wouldn't see any difference there. <laughs> there uh, that there are big differences to be, to be encountered. So really, I have nothing other than admiration and, um, and my benefit to report. But uh, Chandan, of course, um, you know, if um, um, criticism is a sincerest form of flattery, um, uh, flattery will be a sincerest form of criticism. Uh, <laughs> And I wouldn't flatter, and I don't agree, <laughs> and, and, and say why not. <laughs> Actually, I, and again, uh, I do agree in many ways, but I don't in, in some ways, which are important. Um, first of all, it's true that the, um, uh, I don't define, I mean, you provide a definition of 10 characteristics of a theory of justice, but this is not me, that's what you read in the book, that's how I see. I think basically, I, I never thought that the idea of what is a theory, what are the requirements of a theory of justice, is such, so easy to define, because a theory serves so many different purposes. One reason why we need a theory is the, is the way people react if it looks as if that you're being very ad hoc, and again, all very respectable and nice, but you haven't got a theory behind is it. And since I was an activist in the human rights uh, movement, uh, both as president of Oxfam for a three-year period when we were moving strongly from being mainly a relief organization to being to a great extent an advocacy and, and political interventionist organization, it was important for us to have a theory. And it doesn't have to have a complete theory. I, you know, it's, uh, I, I, I still, still make the analytical point that I tried to make this morning uh, with uh, Dick that a complete theory may allow incomplete ordering, but we're not, I'm not even looking for a complete theory. The book wasn't called The Theory of Justice. That's J Jack's book. That's not mine. It was the idea of justice. Um, and nevertheless, to say that there is no theory in it seems a kind of denial, which I think would be false. There is a theory behind it. And the question is what it reaches, and, and do I feel that it answers everything? No. But there is also the underlying question that when we say the human rights uh, idea is not that, that practical people have said that this is very important, but that there is something very deeply important there, which is an alternative, for example, to, say, the utilitarian way of looking at things, not beginning with the idea that uh, feelings and satisfactions are ultimately what that matters, or as they say in the morning in this context, where the well-being is ultimately what this really matters. But there are that freedom in itself matters, and even when it may turn out that uh, a person is using the freedom for a mistaken purpose. And I think uh, that's, uh, you know, I don't think that statement of Voltaire, which I gather from other Berlin, he never uttered, namely that he would give his life to defend another person's right to say something with which he disagrees and which presumably he thinks is wrong, whether or not Voltaire uttered. I think there is a very important recognition of the importance of freedom there, which is not conditional on your using the freedom in the best possible way. So there is an alternative approach there, which I would like to defend. And to the extent that that requires me to have a theory, there is a theory uh, there. Now, of course, John Stuart Mill, of course, uh, famously um, remained utilitarian and also took on many of the concerns that move me. I see from um, Richard Reeves' wonderful book about John Stuart Mill that when Mill was 15, he was very tempted to be a full-fledged, straightforward, Benthamist utilitarian. And I guess 15 is an excellent age to be a <laughs> utilitarian. But um, it's very hard to find traces of that later on in his life. So I think he left it unresolved. And I don't hold it against uh, Mill that he didn't resolve it. I would rather... Mill gave us all these concerns, and uh, the theory may be just a combination of that, which may really have also incompletenesses and 
as Bernard Williams used to say, and in fact I'm putting it in mathematical terms, he didn't put it that way, is not only incompleteness, but overcompleteness. And I think his famous discussion that Agamemnon is both right in thinking that to sacrifice his daughter would be the right thing, and right to think that he wasn't, and, and, and he was also convinced that it, it would be uh, right thing not to do it. Uh, that is the state of thinking on that subject, and a theory could capture that. So ultimately, I think like you, I end up probably not being very different from you, but I am mortally afraid of a theory which takes the form of what at some stage I thought, Chandan, you were asking for, namely, what are these overriding principles? Uh, sometimes they are clear, many cases they are clear, they, you know, I do discuss many of these cases, torture, the kind of terrible situation of um, hunger and famine and so on. But the other cases may not be, and there's no apology for that. Uh, that none need be offered, is that's what I'm saying. And even I'm claiming some theory, my theory would not require that. Yeah, there, was a, there used to be a skit which the, um, they were called the Footlight Review, and then, uh, you know, and then uh, later, later incarnation, by the time they came to uh, America, they were mostly known as Monty Python. But by the time when they began, I think one of the Footlight Reviews I remember watching in Cambridge, uh, was, this would be um, 63, I guess, when they, when they, they chap from the Ministry of Defense arrives, and some people are very worried about nuclear, uh, um, um, nuclear warheads and the dangers of this war. And the Ministry of Defense comes absolutely ready with answers. And one of the members of the audience says, um, I have five questions, to which the Ministry of Defense guy says, yes, and I have five answers. <laughs> and I think that's really what I want to avoid. I don't think we have five answers. We may have three, and they are worth celebrating, and then the two may be worth pondering about. And in that sense, I agree with one of the things I think you've said in passing, that disagreement may be a virtue in the context of a theory of justice, I believe it is a virtue. That's how we proceed, you know, theories of justice. And that, to some extent, connects with um, Smith, too. I think there's every evidence that he, many ways, disagreed with himself uh, in any way. <laughs> but we are also striving, as Anthony rightly said, towards a shared understanding. It's, it's, it's very important. And I think many of the things that I'm saying relates to Anthony's paper, particularly the human rights angle, which is a big thing since, I, as you mentioned, that I have been also quite involved with Paul Farmer and the, and the, and the Partners for Health, uh, that I know that that theorizing is important, but that doesn't require Paul to have a complete theory of what are the human rights that we have to happen, uh, that we need. It's also the same reason, uh, despite the fact that I do think capabilities are very important. It doesn't require me to give a list on a subject on which Martha Nussbaum is upset with me because she thinks that I'm not being a full-fledged uh, capability theorist. Uh, and you know, she had done extraordinarily important work and, and you know, she is, in a sense, the principal capability theorist uh, in, in a, at, at this time. Uh, I don't even agree that capability gives us a straightforward perspective of judging people's freedom. Uh, I give an example in the book that if you were to give men and women the same medical facilities for illnesses, women would live longer than men. Uh, in many societies, they don't. And that's not because um, they are more just societies, and that's because they're unjust societies, because women don't get the treatment that, um, that men do. Now, the question is that if you had only the capability perspective, you won't be able to capture something about processes. I see Lynn and I would agree with that, I think, very much, and she had emphasized that so much in her work. And I don't think the capability can provide not only, an, I mean, mine isn't the capability theory of justice, nor is it the capability theory of freedom. There's much more to freedom than capability. Does that make capability an unimportant issue? No. I think it's important, I raised it in the context of part two of the second principle of roles, and I would prefer that to primary good. But that's that. That's not, the, that's not the basis of an alternative theory of justice. And I come back to the question, um, um, the very interesting issue that Sam 
ways which also relate to some extent in this question. Um, I think the, let me say, I, I really do think that there are a number of things, Sam and you, that we have to discuss. The first is the question of sentiments and feelings. Now, you are the expert and I'm not, but I've never been hesitant to speak with experts against their opinion. And, and, uh, uh, and it's not just because it's fun, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think sentiments uh, for uh, um, Smith is not just feelings. There has to be the, the moral sentiment require the intervention of reasoning. You give examples of that, that we may have a feeling that we that A is really a very desirable thing. And then when we scrutinize our mind, we can say, well, the reason why we're doing that is because A leads to B, and it's B that I'm really seeking. Therefore, what looks like uh, an argument for A is actually an instrumental justification of A for B. So ultimately, these, there's a need for intervention of reasoning in a way that's rather stronger than in the case of Hume, I think. Whether there is a, how much of a distinction there is, I don't know, since I'm trying to give the 300th year anniversary lecture in the in University of Edinburgh on, on, on the 300th anniversary of David Hume. But I hope to have a clear understanding of that. But my, as of this moment, I believe that Schmidt took reasoning more seriously than, than, than Hume did. Um, I think it's also clear to me that uh, Quite a lot of, I think one of the reasons why I find Sim Smith sympathetic, and that goes back to my, almost my school days, is his inclination to raise questions without answering them. Now, I don't always take that view. I know that my friend Bob Nozick was criticized by me a number of times in our joint class when this whole issue of restitution which he raises, this whole chapter ends with three questions. How are we going to deal with it? And then. I told Bob that I was expecting another paragraph after that, maybe answering the question, <laughs> didn't expect it to end. But there are some cases when ending with those questions are marvelous. What he had done, I think, in a big way, but with the feelings issue is quite important, because, the, because of that confusion, and Tom Nagel's PhD thesis was just about that, really, that people may be very happy in doing certain things, but it's not because of the happiness that is being generated. This is the possibility of altruism. It's not because of the happiness that's being generated that you're doing it. It so happened you're doing it for the right reason. And the fact that you're doing it for the right reason also makes you happy. So I think similarly I would say that uh, ultimately they are connected with feeling, but the feelings would indicate that you think that you used adequate reasoning in this case. And therefore the, the kind of dichotomy between, um, between reasoning and sentiment in the Smithian case I would resist the subject to correction by um, Smithian expert. There are two around here, and I have one in my family. So I do get a certain amount of um, authentic uh, textual criticism from, from, from them. But uh, that's the way Smith comes on to me. And I'd say similarly, when it comes to open and close, what is he doing? He's opening up a question, namely, you don't have to look who is entitled to speak, whether he's part of the citizenry. And that, by the way, is, is, is a limitation, I think, of the roles and the way of looking at it, of the theory of justice. And I emphasize again, that's not a comment on the law of the people, which I don't see as a theory of justice at all, but a theory of humanitarianism of, 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 at a deep level, at a, at a moral elite level. But what he's saying is that you cannot confine attention to people. Anyone opinion, which is co cogent, you have to listen to. It has all kinds of relevance. It's relevant for the American originalist position in legal theory. I have a paper on that, which is coming out in the Journal of, um, uh, Oxford Journal of Legal Studies in, in September, uh, discussing uh, you know, what, and it's very much a Bernard Balian interpretation of what did the American revolutionaries think? Did they think that they were privileged in their view? and where they listen to any reasonable argument coming, whether from the French or the British or anybody else. Um, the, I think he was opening that up. And just as, uh, does he succeed? I, uh, I entirely agree with Sam. Knowledge alone wouldn't do it. But uh, Smith said not a claim only about knowledge alone. You have to reason. You have to, knowledge is a very important part of it. But also 
the sophistication of reasoning is, is, is a very important part. Um, let me make two, two, I don't have the quotations here, but I can, and you can probably tell me exact wording of those, the two quotes from Smet. Um, one where you mentioned that there's one occasion where it looks as if that I, he is trying to do a global, uh, but uh, it, it, when he's discussing the Athenian uh, infanticide, what is his position? That because the Athenians have become so parochial um, by being used to knowing only societies in which there is infanticide, it's hard for them to think that a society could survive which doesn't have infanticide. As it happened, there were societies at that time, in, in Aristotle's time, which didn't have a lot of infanticide. And that has so happened, they were on the east of it. It's difficult to think of it now. There were several societies, for example, this is after, uh, after Buddhism, and there will be certainly absolutely impermissible to consider infanticide in any kind of um, uh, permissible sense on grounds of public convenience. Uh, which is what uh, Smith is criticizing. Um, the, the reference here is to not just knowledge, but the reasoning that other people have presented. Uh, he wasn't as learned, yes. He, he wasn't as learned uh, on, 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 on other um, uh, areas of thought as he possibly could have been. But I see an attempt there hankering about that. It comes out also in a statement on the theory of moral sentiment, which I quoted in my introduction to the 250th anniversary Penguin edition of the theory of moral sentiment, um, where uh, he's saying, uh, and it's, it's a kind of one of Smith's arrogant statements, obviously false in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of literal way, but he's trying to make a point. And when he said there isn't a single African in the coast of the United States of, of Africa, from where actually slaves are being recruited, uh, being 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 sent off to America, and there isn't a single African in, in, in there whose natural sense of magnanimity and justice doesn't far exceed anything that his sordid master is capable of understanding. So what he is saying is 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 just a commitment to openness assume that people can reason. And it's a very, very big issue. And you know, I'm glad that this issue came up in this discussion about the anthropological concern. The only thing I would add there, I would stop since the time is more than up, the, um, there is a tendency to think that look for other cultures in terms of something special to you know, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, but, you know, they have engaged in often much the same questions and given answers which are sometimes um, worth listening to, not on grounds that they're specially Hindu or specially Muslim thought, but they're interesting thought in terms of engagements in which Aristotle and Plato might have taken an interest. I mean, to just give an example, which, uh, which I think is a profound implication, uh, Emma and I were trying to produce a course next year on, on Smith. Yeah, and I've been making some reading for it. It's quite interesting to see that of the moguls in India, Aurangzeb gets a lot of reference, mainly because he's giving an example of the tyranny, of the oriental tyranny. The one who doesn't get reference is Akbar. Now, Akbar is, in many ways, perhaps the first theorist of secularism, with the only competition being some uh, thousand years earlier, namely Ashoka, who had a similar theory too. But Akbar is the one who articulated it, he announced it, he, he, he they put forward this act. And the big thing there is treating that it basically is looking for a secular constitution. But the form of secularism is not a Western form, it's nothing against religion. Uh, his argument is that secularism essentially consists of it being equidistant from different religions. States should not favor any religion. If its favor is given to one religion, it should be given to all the other religions. Now that's a totally different view of secularism. And indeed, I think in India they have tended to underestimate the profound impact that it had on Indian thinking on that subject through the national movement, even in Gandhi's and Tagore's song, so, uh, writings, and ultimately on the Indian constitution. And the Indian constitution, secularism, 
is not a secularism whereby any performance of religious performance is not allowed. If somebody is allowed to do a religious function, even in an official building, everybody of other religions would be allowed the same facility. It's a completely different thought. And it's not a specifically Muslim thought. It's, it's, a, it's a thought in an engagement in which the West has also been uh, very involved. So I think what, um, to me, seems to be Smith is doing is that by keeping the shutters down, not having open but closed impartiality, we lose out an argument not on cultural perspectives only. That may have come from elsewhere. Uh, not just knowledge, but also intelligent argument, which I think Albert was an extremely intelligent argument, uh, and a very freedom. People, by the way, it's to the credit of Albert that in his inter multi religious meeting, he invited atheists as well, Lokayat people. Had a, which had been strong in India since 5th century BC, that they had a position along with Sudanese and, and Shias and, and, and the Hindu Vaishnavs and, and Shaivites. Um, uh, they, they also, and, 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 and Jews and, 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 and Christians, they had also a position. So I think there are issues to which um, Smith is pointing, which seem to me to remain profoundly important for the idea of justice, and might I say, for a theory of justice, if understood in the more broad way, in the broader way than I'm trying to present. Well, thank you.